Have you ever caught yourself dreaming of crossing the galaxy like in the movies, hopping from star to star with a miracle engine? Well, it's time to put that dream on the shelf, at least the way Hollywood sells it. The idea of reaching the speed of light feels almost within reach when we see fictional ships accelerating effortlessly. But the real universe is far less forgiving than a screenplay. The laws of physics don't ask for permission, and one of them is crystal clear. Nothing with mass reaches the speed of light. If that sounds harsh, it's better to face it now, with facts. Instead of nurturing an expectation nature doesn't allow. So, why do so many people still believe that one day we'll get there? Watch until the end to understand why it's so hard, and whether we'll ever make it. Before we go on, if this topic fascinates you, hit like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. It helps the channel and lets you know about upcoming videos. A big part of the reason, if we can call it that, comes from the popular imagination shaped by books, series, and films. Stories like Star Trek and the like normalize the idea that an ultra-advanced engine is all it takes to cover absurd distances in minutes. Even productions that try to engage with science, like Interstellar, rely on dramatic shortcuts, a conveniently placed wormhole to solve the monumental problem of distance. All of this feeds a dangerous illusion that the speed of light is a technological hurdle, not a limit built into the very fabric of the cosmos. But the universe doesn't bend to the will of a plot. Even the boldest proposals in theoretical physics eventually slam into the same walls. If we ever want to go truly far, we'll have to accept an uncomfortable truth. There is no magic fix. And to understand why, we need to look carefully at what happens when we try to push an object to extreme speeds. First principle, the speed of light isn't some bureaucratic ceiling. It's a direct consequence of how reality is structured. Relativity tells us that the faster a body with mass moves, the more energy we need to keep accelerating it. In practical terms, the required energy grows without restraint, and at the threshold of light, it blows up to infinity. Picture a spacecraft accelerating in a vacuum. With no air drag, it's tempting to think, just push long enough and you'll get there. But no, as speed rises, effective inertia increases, and each extra step demands even more energy. To generate that extra energy, we'd need more fuel. More fuel means more mass, more mass demands more energy, and the cycle feeds on itself. At the limit, to touch the speed of light, you'd need infinite energy. And infinite energy won't fit in any rocket, not even in the entire universe. There's another detail almost no one mentions. It's not enough to accelerate. You have to slow down. In a vacuum, the bill for deceleration is symmetrical. What you spent to speed up, you'll spend to reduce speed. If it's already impossible to gather infinite energy to go, it would be doubly impossible to stop at the destination or come back. That's why, when we talk about light, we're talking about photons, entities with no rest mass. They're born traveling at sea. They don't need to be accelerated from zero to get there. If they had inertial mass, emitting a single photon would require infinite energy, not happening. Okay, you might think, what if we found some absurd energy source? There would still be a much less glamorous but relentless obstacle, the interstellar medium. Space looks empty, but it's filled with stray atoms, microscopic dust, and cosmic rays. At low speeds, this is irrelevant. At high fractions of light speed, every tiny particle turns into hypersonic ammunition, a dust grain the size of a grain of sand. Hitting the hull of a relativistic ship would release energy comparable to powerful explosives. Even isolated atoms striking the vehicle would generate a shower of ionizing radiation with brutal penetrating power, degrading materials, electronics, and people. The likely outcome? A rain of micro-impacts turning the ship into very expensive fireworks. Mission over. And suppose, purely for the sake of fantasy, that you armored everything and solved the impact problem. There's still an effect you can't dodge. Time dilation. At relativistic speeds, time doesn't pass the same way for all observers. Those on board perceive their clocks running more slowly than those who stayed behind. This isn't a minor detail. It rewrites the experience of the journey. Let's use some numbers to visualize this. Consider a ship reaching 95% of the speed of light 
toward a target 9.5 light years away. For observers on Earth, the math is straightforward. Distance divided by speed, 10 years of travel. For the crew, thanks to time dilation, the live time would be a little over three years. In practice, while people on Earth age a decade, the team on board ages about a third of that. As speed increases, the difference explodes. At 75% of C, time inside the ship flows 1.5 times more slowly than on Earth. At 99% of C, about 7 times more slowly. At 99.9%, .9%, around 70 times. And at 99.9999%, the passage of time inside the vehicle would be tens of thousands of times slower. At the theoretical limit of 100% of light speed, for the passenger, time would seem to stop. At first glance, those numbers are even encouraging. So you can zip across the galaxy quickly from the crew's point of view. That enthusiasm doesn't last. Imagine a trip to Andromeda, about 2.5 million light years away. For outside observers, there's no mystery. Even at nearly C, it would take about 2.5 million years. For those inside, if the ship maintained 99.99% .99 of C, the felt time would drop to something like 35,000 years. And if, with a fine-tuned increase, you upped the speed just a bit, say, another 30 kilometers per second, reaching 99.99999%, the crew would experience a little over 11 years. Wow, right? Wrong. Because in the blink of an eye, 2.5 million years would have passed for the rest of the universe. On return, you wouldn't recognize Earth. It very likely wouldn't even be habitable. Another inconvenient consequence. Even if we mastered cruising at extremely high fractions of sea, that wouldn't help us outrun changes at the destination. Suppose telescopes identify a promising world a few dozen light years away. You depart quickly. By the time the ship arrives, decades have passed outside. Climate shifts, stellar activity, impacts. What was habitable may no longer be. Result, a wildly expensive bet, defeated by time. Okay, you insist. Then we don't need 99.99%. What about 10% of light speed? Now the human factor kicks in. Human bodies tolerate acceleration for short periods. In current launches, astronauts endure peaks of 3 to 4 G for a few minutes, with heavy training and proper suits. To reach 10% of C with a comfortable constant 1 G, equivalent to Earth's gravity, would take about 35 days of acceleration, and then another 35 to slow down. What engine sustains continuous acceleration for over a month, moving many tons, with enough propellant and without melting the ship? Today, none. And even if a miracle of engineering appeared tomorrow, there's still the problem of having enough space to get up to speed. An example helps set the scale. Send, in thought, a crewed ship to the inner edge of the Oort cloud, roughly a thousand astronomical units away. To keep life on board minimally healthy, limit acceleration to 1G. The ship accelerates for 45 days to the turnover point and breaks for another 45 to reach the destination. The maximum speed achieved in this scenario? On the order of 38,000 kilometers per second, around 12% of the speed of light. Notice. Even after months of thrusting, you're nowhere near the limit. There isn't enough runway inside the solar system to touch C. And if you try to shorten the time by increasing acceleration, goodbye crew. Okay, but what about shortcuts? Scientific imagination has proposed two famous shortcuts, the warp drive and wormholes. The so-called warp drive, in Miguel Alcubierre's well-known formulation, wouldn't accelerate the ship itself. It would contract space in front and expand space behind, creating a space-time bubble that moves. Beautiful on paper. The price, however, is steep. Math and physics point to the need for exotic matter with negative energy, something we've never observed in nature. More recent studies suggest that even if this exotic stuff existed, the amount required would be colossal on the order of planetary masses. And that doesn't even touch the question of how to control such a bubble without destroying everything around it. As for wormholes, they appear as valid mathematical solutions in general relativity, connecting distant regions of the universe. But solutions on a blackboard don't guarantee stability. 
Theoretical models indicate that without the same kind of exotic matter to prop up the tunnel's throat, the structure would collapse in milliseconds. Worse, the interior of such a tunnel could be flooded with enough radiation to toast any ship that dared to pass through. Okay, and what if advanced civilizations have already done this? If interstellar travelers exist, either they've found ways to get around the laws we know, an unlikely hypothesis, or they're exploring edges we don't yet understand, but lacking evidence, we have no basis to embrace these scenarios as practical solutions. Absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, of course, but you can't build plans on unsupported assumptions. All that said, humanity isn't doomed to just stare at the stars from afar. Human history is full of impossibles that yielded once we understood the rules of the game better. The issue here isn't willpower or creativity. It's respecting the contours of the cosmic board. There's plenty of room to advance without tearing up the laws. Fast trips within our own solar system using highly efficient technologies, nuclear, advanced electric propulsion, laser-pushed light sails, can dramatically shorten mission times. Investments in shielding, magnetic fields, and system architecture can mitigate part of the harsh deep space environment. Networks of satellites and autonomous probes cooperating like swarms can extend our senses to distances that seem like fiction today. Sometimes, exploring means being present with instruments, not with bodies. But it's healthy to keep perspective. Even if tomorrow we mastered routine cruising at 0.1 c, the nearest stars would still be decades-long trips away, and the galaxy would remain thousands to millions of years away from the outside. For those who travel, time shrinks. For those who stay, it stretches. Societies, ecosystems, entire worlds change in that interval. A crude interstellar project isn't just engineering, it's sociology, biology, psychology, politics, and ethics, and energy. A lot of energy. If you've made it this far, you might be thinking, so it's all just a dream? Number. Science doesn't exist to crush ambitions, but to align them with reality, because only by playing by the rules do we win real games. We don't need to break the universe to explore it. We need to understand it better and better. That includes accepting limits like the speed of light not as a defeat, but as a compass. From there, we can ask, what can we do today that takes us further tomorrow? How do we turn robotic missions into a real bridge of knowledge? Which technologies bring us closer to frequent, safe, relatively fast interplanetary flights? Which legitimate shortcuts? Gravity assists, hybrid propulsion, orbital infrastructure are already on the table. Maybe a thousand years from now, we'll still be talking about the speed of light as an unattainable myth for mass-bearing ships. Maybe in the meantime, we'll have built technological cathedrals spread across the solar system, with fleets of probes roaming the galaxy for us, sending data, images, and discoveries in waves. Or maybe a radical idea still compatible with physics, will emerge and reshape the board in ways we can't imagine today. That's how science moves forward, not by bending reality, but by reading it more clearly. In the end, what matters isn't crossing the map at any cost. It's what we learn with each step and our ability to turn knowledge into new possibilities. If one day we touch the stars with our own hands, it will be because we respected the constraints physics imposes and found creative paths within them, not because we clung to promises of miracle engines. Now tell me, after all this, what do you think is the next realistic step in our journey? Nuclear thermal propulsion? Laser sails pushing micro probes to significant fractions of light speed? A network of telescopes spread all the way to the Oort cloud to survey exoplanets with unprecedented precision? Share your vision in the comments. And if this topic resonated with you, consider supporting the channel. Liking, subscribing, and turning on notifications helps us keep producing more content like this. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.